introduction to the topic. Um, my name is Kelly Alsip, and I work as a horticulture educator for Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. I am based out of Bloomington. My background training was in greenhouse integrated pest management, where while working in the greenhouse, I fell in love with releasing beneficial insects. And if you've heard me speak before, you know I have have a great fondness towards all things creepy crawly. Now that I teach about my passion, insects, I have learned more and more about endangered insects in the Illinois environment. Whether they are the Carner Blue, a small but vividly blue butterfly whose larvae feed on the lupine, or the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, once believed to complete, be completely extinct from the state, I now am learning more and more about how these insects are impacted by people and the plant communities we grow. If you don't say invasive species in the natural areas of Illinois don't have a huge impact on our beloved butterflies and bees, then you are not seeing the big picture. Invasive plants outcompete and displace native plants that these Illinois insects need for survival. Have you ever walked up to someone's front door and said, excuse me, but did you know that you have an invasive species growing in your front yard? Could you take care of that for me or allow me? Or have you ever been talking with someone and they say, I grow an invasive species in my front yard, say purple loosestrife, and I have never seen it get out of control. You hold back the eye roll because no one is ever going to listen to you if you're a know-it-all, but then you have to explain. One adult purple loosestrife plant can produce 2.5 to 2.7 million seeds annually. These seeds are easily dispersed and transported by water, wind, bird feathers, animal fur, and us, of course. Although the, that plant has not, maybe not popped up in your yard, those millions of seeds are going somewhere. So you've made your point. But have you convinced the homeowner to pull up the purple loose drive? Probably not, because they're really pretty. Next time, look them firmly in the eye and say, you are killing butterflies. I mean, who hates butterflies? So, in this talk, I wanted to give you some plant choices while you are convincing others to grow native alternatives, rather than a landscape invasive. Like I said, invasive species are among the leading threats to wildlife. Approximately 42% of threatened or endangered species are at risk due to invasive species. An invasive species can be any kind of living organism, a plant, an insect like emerald ash borer, a fish, like Asian carp, which is the number one invasive in, invasive species for the United States, a fungus, a bacteria, bacteria, or even organisms, seeds, or eggs that is not native to an ecosystem and can cause harm. Um, just because they are not native from Illinois does not mean they are invasive. They must cause harm to the environment, the economy, or humans. Species that grow and reproduce quickly and spread aggressively with potential to cause this harm are then labeled invasive. For instance, Colorado blue spruce is not from here, but it is not invasive. Clearly not invasive, or we would not have so many homeowners having problems with growing this plant. Just so you know, they suffer most of all during wet springs as they do not like their roots to be underwater, 
they require well-drained soil, which can be a feat in the Illinois environment. Invasive plants harm the ecosystem by outcompeting the native plants, reducing nesting sites for birds or possibly confusing birds, reducing habitat for other wildlife, or even serving as an alternate host for a disease. Invasive plants do stuff to outcompete the native vegetation by leafing out earlier shading germinating seeds, adapting to a multitude of growing conditions, or being prolific seeders, which in turn make them easy to grow. Here you see the map of Illinois, and all the shaded green counties have been confirmed sightings of an invasive species known as kudzu. If you've ever been in the southern part of the United States, kudzu is an extremely aggressive invasive species and has been known to take over trees, cars, landscapes, houses. However, is not seen just yet to be that aggressive in Illinois. I just wanted to point out that in my talk today, I'm mostly talking about plants that are on the official invasive species list. However, I will touch on a species of concern. It has not made the list, but it has proven to be invasive in other parts of the country, and therefore care should be taken to monitor this plant. And it's growing really should be discouraged until scientists know more. With thousands, hundreds of thousands of types of plants to grow in the world, why then do we grow just a few? Simply because they are easy to grow in the landscape or garden? Or they're the ones available in the garden centers? The plants are usually from a different part of the world and introduced as an ornamental to the landscape. Most of the time, growers and gardeners alike may unknowingly be selling these plants or growing them in your yards. My first inv landscape invasive is burning bush. In my experience, this bush tends to be placed in a dirty hedge along the home or at the corner of a lot to preserve the lot line. It is mostly ignored most of the year, unless you are trying to get rid of it and cutting it back to the ground, which really only rejuvenates it and makes it bushier. Then in the late summer to early fall, the leaves start to tinge red, and then it glows. And homeowners remember, oh, that is why I have that plant. Despite its unassuming nature most of the year, burning bush forms dense thickets in the undergrowth of forest and displaces native plants. It invades disturbed habitats, fields, roadsides, but also undisturbed woods. Birds disperse the fruit, allowing the plant free range. Unfortunately, you could most likely walk into any garden center and find this plant for sale. Instead, I think you should plant Black Hall Viburnum. It grows a bit taller, up to 12 feet, and the, it has a shiny to dull red fall color attractive white blooms from April to May and boast colorful droops. Burning bush may have a more vibrant fall color, but it does not even come close to competing with the floral and fruit display of this plant. Easily grown in average well-drained soil in the full sun to part shade, it can tolerate some drought. The care for this plant is pruning it immediately after flowering, since the flower buds form in the summer for the following year. It can be grown as a multi-stem shrub or a tree. 
caterpillars of the spring azure butterfly, seen here on the left, will sometimes feed on the flowers. The pat caterpillars come in hues of green and cream. The caterpillars of the Baltimore butterfly occasionally feed on the leaves. The Baltimore butterfly is a chocolate brown butterfly with a lovely pattern of orange and white dots. The caterpillar is orange with black spiky protrusions. Pictured on the right are the droops and the red fall color. The blue black droops are quite attracted to wildlife. Birds, chipmunks, squirrels, and white footed mouse will eat them. Even you can eat them once they are ripe. When in flower, viburnum feeds bees, butterflies, flies, skippers, and our beloved hummingbird moth. These small mysterious pollinators can be seen visiting flowers throughout the summer and fall in order to sip nectar. They beat their wings as fast as a hummingbird but are smaller and they stick out their very long tongue to gather nectar like a butterfly. However, they remain hoovering over the flower. In the fall months, hummingbird moths are numerous and come out close to dusk. We have 60 species of sphinx moth, and mo the most common ones are white line sphinx moth, seen here, clear wing sphinx moth, five spotted hawk moth, and Carolina sphinx. The color of the white line sphinx moth is mottled gray, brown, and white with pink bands. The clear wing sphinx moth is a large moth with clear wings that mimics a bee. However, cherished as adults, the five-spotted hawk moth, also known as tomato hornworm, and Carolina sphinx, also known as tobacco hornworm, incite murderous rage in their larval stage to any gardener trying to grow tomatoes. Here is another alternative to burning bush. It is shorter than your black hall viburnum, and although not native to Illinois, it is native to the southeastern part of the United States, and it is one of my favorite garden plants. Best grown in moist, acidic, organically rich, and well-drained soils in full sun to part shade. It actually flowers better the more sun it is in. But plants do appreciate some afternoon shade in the hot, dry summer climate of Illinois. You cannot grow Father Gilia in heavy soils like you could a burning bush. However, take this time to amend your soil by adding a mix of plant and animal based organic matter. Father Gilia blooms small, fragrant bottle brush flowers in April that cover the plants before the leaves appear, making it quite a show. Leaves turn an often brilliant shades of yellow, orange, and red in the fall, sure to rival any burning bush. Although not as fast growing as a burning bush, this plant is worth the wait for the many attributes it gives to the landscape. I don't really have to identify this plant. Most of you know what it is. It is calorie pear. In the words of former State Master Gardener Coordinator Sandy Mason, Bradford calorie pear has a nasty habit of crashing just as they reach their glory at 15 to 20 years old. Its branching habit is to blame. The tree develops weakly attached branches with narrow crotch angles. Plus, there are usually six to eight branches coming from the same point on the trunk. They look like upside down umbrellas. Often large limbs are lost in wind or ice storms, but can also fall on a calm day. Typically, limbs rip down the trunk and give the tree a very unsymmetrical look. The trees are doomed to a pruning cut at the ground level. Ah, I couldn't have said it any better. 
while these trees are attractive in bloom during the springtime. That is their only redeemable quality. In fact, they are considered invasive plants in both Illinois and the eastern half of North America. If you drive on the highways in the spring time, you will see multiple white blooming trees. New cultivars to address the poor branching habit described by Sandy are hybridized to produce sterile fruit, to produce are hybridized with native ornamental pears and produce fertile fruits, unlike the sterile fruit of Bradford. Here's the Bradford Kelly pear along the, the bad branch angles and then along the roadsides. Instead of calorie pear, plant downy serviceberry, also known as Amelanchor arborea. It is a multi-stemmed shrub or small tree that grows 15 to 25 feet tall. It is the most common service berry species in the state. Like ornamental pear, it is tolerant of a wide range of soils. Although ornamental pear flowers before the leaves emerge and is reminiscent of a white cloud according to Durr, Michael Durr, tree expert, downy service berry blooms when the leaves emerge, making the trees slightly less effective, but ornamental in its own right. It blooms in April about the same time as ornamental pear, and the flowers are highly sought out by bees, flies, and beetles. The leaves emerge with a grayish pubescent, turn medium to dark green in the summer, and in the fall turn yellow, apricot orange to dusty red. Considering the leaves are not as glossy as the calorie pear, the color may not be as vibrant by mo no means less impressive as seen in this picture. Downy service berry is one of the best native trees for fall color. The berry-like poems is why you're growing this tree. They are far more ornamental and attractive to wildlife than the brown poem of the calorie pear. They start off as green, turn red, then when they are ripe, a purplish black. The birds will celebrate in your yard when they see this buffet of sweet berries that are reminiscent of blueberries. Ruffed grouse, hairy woodpecker, hermit thrush, cedar waxwing, Baltimore oriole, and many others relish eating the berries. However, once you try them, you may be in competition with them too. Amelanker is a larval food source for striped hair streak butterfly and the red spotted purple butterfly seen here along with many other moth caterpillars like the dagger moth. Red spotted purple is not purple and not spotted red. It is two and a half to four inches wide with black on the upper wing and iridescent blue on the hind wing. On the underside, there's rows of orange spots along the edge of the wings with more orange spots near the body. The adult butterflies feed on sap, rotting fruit, carrion, dung, and will be attracted to moist gravel patches. The caterpillar on the amelanchor tree re resembles bird poop and overwinters in a hibernaculum. A hibernaculum is a leaf rolled up and used to protect the caterpillar throughout the winter months. more garden-friendly hybrid is Amelanchor x grandifolia. This one's best grown in well-drained soil with supplemental watering during drought. Can be grown in full sun to part shade. Amelanchor x grandiflora is a hybrid cross between 
the native service berry, downy service berry, we talked about before, and Allegheny service berry. This is a small, multi trunked tree or tall shrub and can grow 15 to 20 feet tall. It flowers in April, followed by the edible fruits in June. These fruits will also make the birds love your backyard. Then the leaves turn a brilliant red to orange red in the fall, ready to rival any ornamental pear. Barberry. Uh, to a horticulturist, barberry is boring, but easy to grow, and the cultivars come in a multitude of amazing colors. Its adaptability makes it a go-to for landscapers and homeowners. But if I see another barberry spirea combination, I am going to wonder where is our creativity? This shrub has started invading shady woodlands, open fields, and wetlands. The bright red fruits are rapidly spread by birds. It outcompetes by leafing out earlier in the spring, causing it to shade native plants. Instead of growing blackberry grow, I propose replacing boring and bullying of a shrub, which is barberry. I propose growing black chokeberry, Aronia melancarpa, which blooms in late spring. It also produces numerous black leathery fruits that persist into the winter and glossy green leaves that provide an outstanding fall color. Although the habit is not as dense and neat as the barberry, the shrub can be pruned after flowering to keep it more compact. The shrub is also known to produce sucker, so pruning out the older canes is recommended. You could prune plants in the late winter or early spring before bud break. You can also do a rejuvenation pruning, which means pruning all the way to the ground to just a few inches. This method will take the plant out of fruit production for just a few years. Aronia berries can be eaten fresh right off the bush, though they can be a little bit astringent, which is why most people cook with them instead. There are some varieties that have been selected for less suckering, more compact growth, and improved yields and fall color. For instance, Autumn Magic has a more compact habit, more brilliant fall color, and larger, more abundant fruit clusters. Variety Alata has a more brilliant fall color, larger, abundant fruit colors, but also exhibits reduced suckering. Because the leaves are glossy, the fall color is impressive. Fall color can be wine red to purplish black, although they do not exhibit the colorful leaves throughout the entire year, they do have a nice fall color and fruits that attract a plethora of wildflower. Wild life. <laughs> Bees visit the flowers, birds like the fruits, and caterpillars can eat the foliage. One of those such bees is an andronid bee, also known as a mining bee. It's a native bee that will be attracted to the flowers of black chokeberry. These bees nest in the underground. Even though they are solitary, their nests can be found in large groups in your lawn. It's usually very thin, thinly stand lawn. These bees are good foragers of pollen and nectar on early flowering plants. So if you see a bunch of holes in the lawn and bees coming out of it, it's a good bee. It's a pollinator. Winter Keeper is a vigorous evergreen invader that accepts many growing conditions. 
which has made it a go-to ground cover for homeowners. You can commonly see it creeping up a tree. It displaces native plants in forest openings and forest edges. It is fast growing and tolerates full sun to full shade. Not many, very many plants can do that. Instead of planting whipper, winter creeper, plant wild ginger. It is a low maintenance ground cover boasting attractive heart-shaped leaves that can be grown in partial shade to full shaded conditions. From April to May, they bloom this purplish brown cup-shaped flower that is usually hidden under the foliage, but is always a great find. Beetles and flies visit the blooms in early spring. The flower has evolved to attract small pollinating flies that emerge from the ground early in the spring looking for a dead animal carcass that did not survive the winter. By lying next to the ground, flowers are readily found by the flies emerging from their pupa. The color of the flower is similar to decomposing flesh. Whether these flies pollinate the flower or not is in dispute. Nevertheless, they do enter the flower to escape the cold winds in early spring and to feast upon the flower's pollen. Some of the pollen attaches to their bodies and is taken with them when they visit the next flower. Although it's slower in getting established compared to Euonymus, it forms dense thick habit spreading by rhizomes whose textures can rival the colors of your winter creeper. The leaves of wild ginger is an alternate host plant for the beautiful pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. Its caterpillars are brownish black with a row of orange spots down their back. Although not evergreen, it leaves out really early in the spring. Hooverflies is one of the insects that will pollinate or potentially pollinate wild ginger. And they are likely buzzing about any nectar producing flower in your garden this summer. And they live lot they lived their life amongst the wild ginger this past spring. These flies, commonly mistaken for bees, are one of the most prolific pollinators in the Illinois garden. Hoover flies are excellent flyers, flying backwards and forwards and hovering over their beloved flowers. Hover flies are yellow and black bee mimics that feed on pollen, nectar, and honeydew. Honeydew is aphid poop. They mimic bees and wasps for protection against their predators, such as birds. They can be easily distinguished from bees because they are shiny and bees are fuzzy, and they have much larger eyes. With many generations per growing season, hoover flies are here to stay. The female hoover fly will usually lay her eggs near or amongst aphid colonies. And in two to three days, the larva will hatch. The larva, which is technically a maggot, is muted, green, legless, worm-like, and can be found on the other sides of, undersides of leaves, eating aphids, thrips, scale, caterpillars, and mealybugs. The larva grasp the prey with their jaws, hold them up in the air, suck out the body contents, and toss the exoskeleton aside. Who wouldn't want this great garden warrior slash pollinator in their garden. My next invasive is shrubby bush clover. It is an aggressive invader that displaces native vegetation and was originally planted on purpose for wildlife vegetation and erosion control. Growing about six foot tall, it exhibits exhibits trifoliate leaves in a loosely held branches. It's fast growing. It flowers in July to August and is a readily self-seeder. Instead of sh shrubby bush clover, 
plant elderberry. This elderberry has large white lace inspired flowers and they're popping up along the roadside on shrubs all over Illinois. And they are one of this horticulture's favorite specimen plants. Easy to grow in full sun to partial shade, this plant can grow 4 to 12 feet tall and has a long four-week bloom time in midsummer. That is far showier and more fragrant than any bush clover. The flowers are followed by purplish black droops that are loved by many birds. The flowers attract bees, flies, and butterflies. These plants, these plants are spread by root suckers to form colonies. Plants think it can be kept in check by pruning. Suckers, as they appear, are pruning in the winter. Whether you prune out the dead stems or you shorten one-year stems, cutting back, shorten one-year stems to a node, or cut back to the ground with rejuvenation cutting. If you do not prune elderberries, sometimes they can become unattractive and weedy in appearance. And they are a bit more short-lived compared to the bush clover. Although plants are self-pollinated, fruit yields can be increased by planting more than one cultivar together. The fruits are purple-black appearing in August and are loved by birds. This plant is a showstopper. Another native alternative to bush clover is high bush blueberry. And it is recommended by most horticulturists here in Illinois as opposed to regular blueberries because it is easier to grow in our soil. It grows between 6 to 12 feet high on upright multi-stem shrub in full sun to part shade. Like blueberries, this plant does prefer more acidic, organically rich soils and benefits greatly from mulching around the base to preserve moisture. The flowers are white urn shaped. They're born in the May for about two weeks before the leaves start to unfold. They are a great early nectar and pollen source for overwintering bees. The berries then mature in August and are bluish black with a white bloom. This blue, this bloom is the white stuff you rub off in your fingers that acts as a sunscreen for the plant. Durr says two to three plants can provide several quarts of blueberries. And as an added bonus, this plant has excellent red fall color lacking the dingy yellow color of the bush clover. Men, there are many hybrids of this plant, and all the flowers are self-fertile is best to allow cross-pollination for a larger crop yield. Chinese privet, primarily used as a hedge, this evergreen can grow in full sun to partial shade. It has creamy, white, fragrant flowers in August, and it is tolerant of a wide range of conditions, all contributing to its invasive qualities. Plants form dense thickets and shade out other native plants. The showy fruits persist and are distributed in the natural areas by birds. Two other species European privet and border privet are showing showing the same aggressive tendencies as Chinese privet. It can be quite difficult to distinguish between these species. However, rather, rather than planting privet, plant um, high bush cranberry. 
I burn them? This native alternative to privet can also be used as a hedge or a shrub border that grows in full sun to light shade about 8 to 10 feet high. In April, these white lace cap panicles cover the plant for about four weeks, followed by drooping clusters of red berries in the fall that persist into the winter. The leaves are glossy green, changing to a yellow red or reddish purple. This plant is adaptable to extremes. American high bush cranberry is one of the easiest viburnums to grow and be, can be kept in check with pruning after flowering. Bees, flies, and beetles visit the flowers and birds eat the fruits. This shrub provides all the attributes that privet hedge can provide without the risk of invading natural areas. Another alternative to privet is winterberry. It grows in partial sun and moist to acidic soils. Although the flowers are insignificant, the showy fruits during the winter provide interest like no other. The greenish white flower are visited by bees and flies in the midsummer. Winterberries are dioecious, which means they have separate male and female plants. Only fertilized female flowers will produce these attractive red berries that are a signature to the species. Generally, only one winterberry will be sufficient to pollinate six to ten female plants. Flowers appear on new growth. Prune to shape in early spring just before new growth appears. The red, bud, the red berries are highly sought out by songbirds. Everybody loves this evergreen ground cover. It's so pretty, they say. It is super easy to grow and get established. However, in Illinois, the only acceptable ivy is the silk is located in the silk flower area of your local craft store as this pretty vine is a tree killer. English ivy aggressively climbs trees, eventually killing them. It covers the ground floor, choking out all that's in its path. Its fruits are readily spread by birds, and it serves as an alternative host to bacterial leaf scorch, which affects a wide variety of our Illinois trees. Rather than English ivy, plant barren strawberry. Instead, barren strawberry is also evergreen in mild winters. It produces yellow blooms in the spring, followed by small strawberry-looking inedible akenes. It adapts to a wide range of soils. I have allowed this plant to take over my backyard on the edge of beds and between stepping stones. Everyone always asks me if the berries are edible, and I say yes, but they're not good at all. I have seen several bees and flies on the flower, and I'm looking forward to keeping, and am looking forward to it helping me keep the other weeds at bay. One of the weeds I must keep at bay is sweet autumn clematis. A breathtaking bloomer in the fall, this plant is aggressive and fast-growing and easily invades natural areas, unkept landscapes, and pops up all over my backyard and my neighbor's yard. After bloom, the seeds waft like feathers around through the air. So rather than sweet autumn clematis, plant woodbine. It is a climbing vine that has fragrant white flowers similar to sweet autumn clematis in the late summer to early fall. It can be planted in full sun to part shade and if given support will climb the way the clematis does. Bees, wasps, and flies are attracted to the flower and some moth caterpillars eat the foliage. It can be pruned back to a node 
where the leaf meets the stem, in the fall after flowering. It lacks the tough leathery leaves of sweet autumn clematis. It supports wasps and bees. Most of us know that honeybee is economically important insect and because of its pollination services it provides. However, some of the native bees, particularly mason bee, don't get the credit they deserve for contributions they make to our garden and food crops. Unlike non-native bees, unlike the non-native honeybees, the majority of native bees are solitary, living in the ground or hollowed out stems, and are unlikely to sting because they do not need, have the need to defend the social colony. An understanding of the life cycle of some of these solitary bees will help you in your pollinator garden. One such good bee, solitary bee, is a leaf cutter bee. And it is usually black or gray, smaller than the honey bee, which is amber colored. These bees construct their nest in existing hollow cavities found in nature or may excavate a hole in a rotten log or twig. The females construct a, construct a series of cells using oval to semicircular pieces of leaf tissue to separate her chambers. Most of the time damage is not noticed, but these leaf cutting bees prefer rose, lilac, ash, sassafras, Virginia keeper, she then leaves a mix of pollen and nectar paste as a provision for her growing larva. Marla Spivak, a bee researcher at the University of Minnesota, says honeybees get all the hype, but it just may be the little green bee pollinating our flowers that may be the most important. Thor Hansen, an author about bees, said bees are like oxygen essential and for the most part unseen. While we might overlook them, they lie at the heart of relationships that bind the humans to natural worlds. It is, it is also assumed flower, flowering plants co-evolved rapidly with bees pollinating them, a notion Darwin never believed, says Thor. Darwin believed flowering plants existed all along and just spread rapidly. Bees evolved from wasps and began to get their food from flowers instead of various forms of other insects in the environment. Although wasps need meat to feed their larvae, which is why they sting, they continued to be great pollinators of flowers in their adult form. Thor says, if a flower is not round, it is probably not pollinated by a bee. I love Virginia creeper. It's a woody vine. It turns scarlet red or burgundy in the fall. It has these blue violet berries. And again, like I said earlier, it's used by leaf cutting bees to build their nest. Circles out of the foliage is an exciting find. This plant likes partial sun, but will tolerate full sun and partial shade. Another vine that should be planted in, instead of sweet autumn clematis is trumpet honeysuckle. Although it is not a native to Illinois, but southeastern United States, this vine is a longtime bloomer of scarlet orange flowers that are visited by not only bees in the early spring but ruby-throated hummingbirds and the foliage can be eaten by clear wing moth caterpillars while the red berries are eaten by birds in the fall. This vine is very easy to grow. This next plant, butterfly bush, is a species of concern. Despite Many seeing bees and butterflies visiting the flowers of this prolific plant. It has become a prolific invader of the Northeast and specific Northwest. It forms dense thickets that are hard to remove. 
and it actually takes over native plants as nectar sources for pollinators, which then it in turn reduces pollination of the native plants. Most people believe it is a great plant to have because it's usually covered in butterflies and bees and it attracts pollinators. However, with the possibility of escaping into our areas and and potentially out competing our native plants, I would not suggest growing butterfly bush in the state of Illinois, but instead grow butterfly weed. It blooms in the summer on two foot tall plant. It's a larval source for monarch caterpillars. Its nectar supports a multitude of bees, flies, wasps, beetles, and butterflies. In conclusion, this webinar is great for establishing new landscapes, but most of you probably have some of these mature plants in your garden and have grown quite fond of them for their ease and growth. So, do I suggest removing them? I do. Our gardens are ever changing and these landscape invasives should not be allowed to invade our natural areas. As a gardener, it will be fun to start with a new plant. I myself recently bought a new house and the first thing I have done is remove these invasives. Although the burning bush was difficult to get out of the ground and the sweet autumn clematis pops up everywhere, I continue to address these and have great plans to plant more of these native alternatives. Thank you. I did want to mention um, this QR code and you can go and take a survey about the talk today and give us feedback. We promise to use it and make our programs better for the future.